Uh, welcome to Milan 2023, 8 Seattle's annual fundraising dinner. I would, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your weekend to come and spend this evening with us. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, my name is Ahmed Ghosh. I'm a volunteer for 8 Seattle. Uh, so we'll spend the evening talking a bit about aid, the work some of our uh, volunteers and uh, people we support uh, through aid are doing, and uh, uh, we'll continue from there. So um, India today is a study in contrasts. Uh, it supplies a wide range of medicines and vaccines to countries around the world, and it has world-class private medical facilities uh, available. However, a large percentage of India's uh, own population does not have access to good health care. Uh, Indian food and culture is exported around the world and is pretty famous, but uh, when it comes to our own farmers who are actually growing that food, they are dealing with problems like crushing debt and uh, getting insufficient prices for their crops. So uh, the Association for India's Development or AID uh, is a grassroots volunteer movement. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to connect these two worlds by working in areas like agriculture, health, education, women's empowerment, anti-corruption movements, uh, and among others. So what AID believes uh, is that, and it's fairly unique in that not a, a lot of organizations are very focused on, on a specific purpose or a specific area of work. But what AID believes is that a lot of these problems are interconnected and they cannot be solved in isolation. So they need to be tackled as integrated solutions. So you'll hear more about these issues from the speakers in the evening. Uh, there are also some brochures and pamphlets we have left on the tables that will uh, inform you more about these. So as you hear about the work that the speakers are doing, uh, our hope is you come away with uh, one realization. So for us in this room, uh, donating today may not be the most significant act we do in our lifetimes. Right? There'll be a lot more, more important, more critical things we'll do. Um, however, it is one of the most significant steps we can take towards securing the rights, securing the livelihood, and securing justice for the underprivileged people in India. Since 2020, the 8th Seattle chapter has distributed over $630,000 for various projects in India. And your support and generosity this evening will allow us to continue this work and hopefully expand on it further. I would now like to call on Ravi to come over and say a few words. Um, Ravi founded AID while he was uh, pursuing his PhD in particle physics at the University of Maryland um, at College Park. Since then, AID has grown. It now has dozens of chapters. It has hundreds of volunteers around the world. Uh, Ravi still remains deeply committed to AID and spends a lot of his time on it. Uh, when he does have some free time, he apparently loves, loves writing poetry. And just as a casual thing, he publishes papers on physics. <laughs> so, Ravi, please come on over. Thank you, Amit, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's great to be in Seattle after many years and after the break in the pandemic, uh, due to the pandemic. And it's lovely to see everybody here, uh, including, you know, my friends from IIT days. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we called ourselves Innovations Inc. So that was probably a better name than AID <laughs> that we came up with. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Siad, uh, of course, Rewards, Saif, and all his friends. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all, and Sunita, and all the volunteers, Samyukta, Sri Priya, everybody who worked so hard to make this event happen. So I'll try to say a couple of things about AID at a high level, and I don't, uh, and then I'll go on to introduce our speakers. Uh, so at University of Maryland, what we thought was that we need to create a channel to connect to grassroots India. After all, uh, you know, we are the people that India has produced to face, uh, you know, to deal with the challenges of our country, right? And being here is no excuse <laughs> not to engage with that. And of course, the grassroots India is facing the challenges of our country, right? They are like they are at the center stage 
of challenges. And our idea was to connect the two, right? And that's what aid is. Now, if you imagine creating the channel or a village person just visiting you here, uh, then you would actually talk about all the issues, right? You'd be interested in knowing everything about that village person. And therefore, we did not restrict ourselves to doing one thing, like say education or health. So you will find in aid literally uh, that aid is involved in multiple issues, like whether it's agriculture, health, education, human rights, livelihoods, uh, and, and environment. So it's an organization that literally is, a, is engaging with India in all the complexity of India because we are the people and the people in the villages are the people who India has created to deal with the challenges and we want to keep that in our mind and we don't want to lower that bar and make the challenge any less. So this was the idealism with which we started AID and uh, one of the people who came from IIT Madras two or three years who started AID, well, after we started AID there was Kiran and uh, at that time we were so enthusiastic that we would have received him in the airport and all the other people who came to India to University of Maryland we would have taken him around to tabling and fundraising events we were organizing and doing. We would have given him, shown him videos of, you know, work in India. And after a month, I sat around with this entire group who just freshly came from India and asked them one question. So, you know, you got oriented to aid just as you got oriented to University of Maryland. So what do you all think about it? To this day, I remember Kiran's answer to that question. Kiran's answer was that, now I know why I came to the US to go back to India and to work in the villages. Kiran graduated from University of Maryland, got his master's, worked here at Hughes for a few years, and then kept his word. He went back, and what amazed me is this young person who so well knew that that's what he wanted to do, could do for the farmers of India, which is a completely different field, what you are about to hear from him. Kiran Visa. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, thanks everybody for coming over here today. Uh, it's very a pleasure to be in Seattle and meet with all the Seattle volunteers and uh, supporters uh, because uh, uh, you've been consistently supporting the work uh, that we and other organizations in India do with farmers, particularly agriculture has been one of the focus areas of the Aid Seattle uh, chapter. So we know that, uh, you know, the lives of farmers in India uh, is very, very different. It's a different world out there compared to what we experience. Uh, so uh, what we thought is we'll have a special guest today, a farmer from India uh, who can join us uh, on a link. Hopefully the technology works. And uh, we'll hear from her, and then we'll uh, go on with the presentation. Hello, Sri Lata, Vinipistonda? Ah, Vinipistonda. Okay, so this is uh, Sri Lata. Uh, she is a farmer from Kolanupaka village in Telangana. And uh, she has faced one of the most uh, challenging situations uh, when she lost her husband, uh, who committed suicide because of issues that he faced in farming. So let us hear from her, what is it that she went through and how, what she's doing now. Uh, so I'm uh, just, I'm going to ask her, uh, you know, what is it that led her husband to commit suicide and what are the problems that she has faced? Uh, Srilata, me bharta yenduko atmati chesko al so chindi atlante samasalu nai adh kon chapta va? Ah, thanks sir. Good morning, sir. Na kairi Srilata, na kidru, idhar babu sir. I am a student Sorry uh, for that connectivity issue. Uh, so uh, what she was saying is that 
uh, her uh, husband and she, both of them are farmers. Uh, they own about three acres of land of their own, uh, but that's not sufficient to make a living. Therefore, they lease another five acres of land uh, to do cultivation. Uh, and uh, there was a failure of rains uh, due to which they lost the cotton crop that they sowed. And also the bore wells that they had dug in their land also failed. So therefore, uh, they actually got into a debt uh, of uh, about 5 lakh rupees, that's 500,000 uh, rupees. And uh, because of the debt and because the system was not, uh, uh, you know, the, the, because the farmer was not getting any help from the system uh, when he's facing this kind of a situation due to lack of rains, you know, which is not, um, uh, you know, something that he can help. Uh, therefore, he actually ended up taking his life. And uh, after that, uh, she had to take care of the family. Uh, she had two children. One was eight years old, one son, another son was seven years old. And uh, they uh, were actually entitled. You know, when a farmer commits suicide in India, in Telangana, uh, where we work, uh, actually there is a government program which uh, is supposed to help that family get back onto its feet. Basically because the government recognizes that uh, it's a system failure which caused the suicide. It's not just an individual failure of that farmer. Uh, so they do a certain uh, process of verification and then decide that because of uh, things which uh, went out of hand, this person committed suicide. So therefore, it's the government's obligation to support. Um, but uh, she made the rounds of uh, government offices for several uh, years, uh, uh, for about three years, uh, after which she finally got uh, uh, Hemant, can you see if uh, they are connecting back? In case they connect back, you can just switch. Okay. Uh, so after uh, 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 you know, after going uh, through the government process, uh, she actually was informed at one point that she, uh, uh, you know, she has her case has been approved for this support from the government. She's supposed to get six hundred thousand rupees from the government, but she never received it. Uh, so that is where our group entered into the picture because we work with many farmers, hundreds of farmer suicide families across Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. And uh, uh, we uh, basically took her case uh, to the higher ups, to the collector, to the uh, ministers in Hyderabad. Still, uh, the, the money was not coming through because they were basically saying that there's not enough budgetary allocations and so on. So finally, we ended up going to the court. So we filed a court case. And, uh, 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 and not only for her, but there were 400 such farmer suicide families who were waiting for support from the government. So let's just try uh, once again. Um, uh, Srilata, are you talking about so, if you have a lot of support, you can help me with my support. So, I'm asking for uh, okay, you know, when she didn't get a support, what kind of support she received from the organization. Uh, sir, in 2015, I was in the organization. In 2018, I was in the organization. In 2018, I MRO, VRO, Alvochiru, Enquiries, Rubai, the Girkochiru, Amala Borlu Jushi, Rupolam Jushi, Rani Jushi, the reason correct, the Raito At Martin and Gurtinchi, Maku Prosding Oda, Ochinanka Dila in Dinka. Our time lo Maku Raito Sarajevedi Karnavalu, Maku Chala support to the Ochi, Miku, Mimuna Mamma Miku, Anian Jarutundi, Mimu, Kotlar the Mani Mimu, and the Raito Sarajevedi Karnavalu, my court lock a case. Ante mema ma collector gani ma mige ta adhikar la kandre ki letter iste So basically, uh, we filed this court case, and uh, even in the court, the government actually did not uh, immediately respond to actually accept their responsibility. So one of the things that we had to do even after filing the court case was that to make it in a public issue to build pressure on the government. Uh, so uh, here you have uh, the same farmer Srilata who is speaking uh, in a public hearing uh, because uh, you know the system was not responding. We decided we will create a stage where we will have eminent persons sitting, uh, the senior professors and senior activists who are working with farmers and she will present her case before uh, uh, before the jury and uh, it's not just her, there were 200 plus 
farmer suicide families you know the women from there who came to that public hearing and that became a big uh, issue which was covered in the state uh, media it was front page news in many uh, um, uh, you know many newspapers as well as she was interviewed on ndtv so these kind of things actually built the pressure on the government and in fact uh, this public hearing was held on uh, 16th december 2021 and on 24th december 2021 just 8 days later the government actually issued an order uh, sanctioning and uh, releasing these funds uh, to 133 families uh, which were in the same situation as sri lata and uh, basically it was 8 crore rupees which was released uh, that's about 1 million dollars uh, which went to the uh, most distressed farmer families uh, in telangana uh, so uh, if we look at the story of uh, sri lata basically um, uh, you know her farmer her, her husband committed suicide because of uh, you know things which were out of their control you know they are tenant farmers they can't get uh, you know loans from the bank so therefore they have to depend on the money lenders for loans and uh, when the crop fails there's no intervention from the government uh, so this is actually a systemic failure and uh, she uh, and uh, you know thousands of such families are facing this kind of situation and second thing is that uh the kind of help that we were able to provide you know as a uh, just a civil society organization working and with the help of uh, organization uh, like aid is to provide her a sewing machine uh with 10 or 15000 rupees so that she can uh, stay afloat right basically make some additional income and stay afloat however the real transformation in her life came when the government support came that means basically whatever she is entitled to from the government when that comes through then there's a transformation in her life because uh, she got 600000 rupees 500000 rupees of that got deposited in her account and uh, another 1 lakh rupees was basically to defray the debt so uh, there's a one time settlement of debt which happened she had uh, loans of about 5 lakh rupees pending to various uh, private uh, uh, money lenders uh, but the government officer basically the rdo uh, who is a divisional magistrate got all of them to sit and basically said that we have 1 lakh rupees to settle all your debt and uh, distributed that 1 lakh rupees uh, proportionally among them and that was a write off of all her debt so through this kind of process she is now actually back on her feet she is cultivating the two or three acres of land that she has in fact uh, this morning when we talked to her she basically said that uh, in the three acres of land she got almost 100 quintals of paddy production last year so she is very happy and the money that she got from the government she is using for the education of her kids uh, who are now in 10th or uh, 9th or 10th grades uh, so this is the kind of uh, transformation that we can achieve when we try to get the system work for the uh, people and uh, just in terms of the entitlements to farmer suicide families uh, in our work through the last 3 uh, years from 2020 to 22 we were able to get about 3 million dollars sanction to 400 uh, such families in telangana and uh, much larger number in andhra pradesh 4060 families got uh, some of them got the full entitlement of uh, 7 lakh rupees some of them got a partial entitlement of 1 lakh rupees but the total amount comes to about 11 million dollars uh, so i just wanted to uh, stress that uh, when we uh, work on making the system deliver what they are supposed to to farmers uh, then uh, you know that can leverage uh, whatever support we provide from here to a much bigger scale so 14 million dollars it's about 100 times uh, what our team uh, you know requires as a financial support to keep this kind of work uh, going uh, uh, so when we think about sri lata when we look at sri lata uh, you know she's uh, very courageous not only facing her own personal situation but also challenging the system you know she was able to come to hyderabad stand on the road and speak uh, uh, you know about where the government was falling short uh, so when we think about indian farmers i would like to think uh, like all of us to think about them not just as distressed people who need our help uh, but they are actually making a very valuable contribution uh, to the society to the country uh, they are uh, very skilled people producing things which everybody needs uh, which i think not many of us can claim that you know whatever we produce the world cannot do without uh, they are actually producing things that the world absolutely requires and uh, they are multitasking they are multi skilled a farmer is also a soil scientist also a biologist also knows how to control 
uh, pests and diseases also uh, knows how to uh, uh, you know milk a cow maintain a cow also knows how to market the produce uh, also knows how to predict weather right so there is a multitasking and a risk taking entrepreneur is who a farmer is and uh, farmers are the biggest category of entrepreneurs in india every season they are investing their money their sweat and their uh, knowledge and skills into producing things but uh they are still facing a different difficult situation uh there are many reasons but one of the main things to understand is that just like any enterprise or any field uh there needs to be an enabling environment to actually make it work make it profitable and certain public support systems which need to work for the farmers you know just like any enterprise they need to have access to finance they need to have access to affordable bank loans otherwise they fall into the debt trap with the money lenders they need uh, support when there is a climate risk they need uh, crop insurance they need disaster relief these are the kind of things uh, which uh, if they work then uh, you know farming would work uh, much better uh, in india uh, when these don't work uh, then our job is basically try to make sure that these public support systems really reach the farmers so that is basically what we decided will be the focus of our work we are involved in other kinds of work like providing relief to farmers who are in distress uh, building cooperatives of women farmers uh, so that they get a collective bargaining power so this is the kind of constructive work that we are doing uh, but what i really want to focus on uh, today is to uh, is on the work of uh, how to make the government work for farmers uh and that is where i feel that we can leverage our time and our resources much better to uh, benefit the farmers uh so one of the initiatives that we began is a helpline for farmers uh so there are many policies which exist in india there are many schemes and programs which are meant to benefit the farmers but they actually don't reach uh the farmers who are in need uh, so to bridge that gap we actually initiated this uh, kisan mitra helpline which is a unique initiative where we are working hand in hand with the government uh, so where the government doesn't work we are ready to take the streets or to the court but we are also ready to work very cooperatively with the government with the local officials to make sure that uh, whatever uh, problems the farmers face can get solved so this is a helpline number which is available in several districts in telangana and andhra pradesh so a farmer can call that helpline with any problem that they have and we have a team of people who take the calls uh you know every call is recorded every case every problem case is entered into a, a system that we built and it is tracked unless the problem is actually solved and the farmer calls and tells us back that it is solved the case is not closed so we follow up on each and every case so in some cases we can just uh, help them by uh giving them advice on the phone that you know if this is the problem that you are having that this particular scheme you are not benefiting these are the things steps that you need to take but we also have field workers who are working in those districts where the helpline runs so they also uh, if necessary go to the farmer's house they also go along with the farmer to the government officials many of these problems basically require the uh you know some department or the other to do their job properly uh so uh, just to give an example uh this is another farmer his name is mallappa he is a farmer from uh, vikarabad district in uh, telangana when he called our helpline basically he was in a deep distress he was almost breaking down he said i am about to commit suicide uh, in fact uh, somebody just told me a few hours ago that there is this kind of helpline so this is my last ditch attempt and if that this doesn't work uh, uh, you know or if if uh, i didn't know about this helpline i would have been dead by now this is what basically he told the counselor so we had to uh, you know counsel the person to kind of uh, calm down and not take any extreme step and then inquire about the problem basically his thing was that he was already having a lot of debt which his father took and his father passed away a uh, couple of years ago and now he's sown a sugarcane crop and sugarcane crop crop was die, drying up so he was going to go into even more loss and he was desperate uh then we had to probe you know what are the other what are the you know all the interconnected issues that uh, the farmer is facing uh what we found is that basically if if the farmer is able to set up a drip irrigation system uh then the water that comes in his borewell is sufficient to irrigate the sugarcane crop without the drip irrigation system his sugarcane crop is drying up uh the government does have a scheme of course installing a drip irrigation system requires um uh, some investment the government does have a scheme where very poor farmers from him especially from a disadvantaged background he is a scheduled caste farmer uh, they give drip irrigation system with a 90% subsidy 
but he was not able to get the subsidy because the land is in his father's name it never got transferred to his name 18 months ago his father had died he was doing the rounds of the uh, revenue department uh, but they were not transferring the land to his name so these are the kind of issues interconnected issues uh, uh, that he is caught up in uh, so when we stepped in basically because we are working with the officials, we immediately talked to the Tasildar, our person went there and within one day his land record was changed into his name. So what does it mean? It means that that official could have done it 18 months ago, right? Because it was just a one day job to do. He did not do it because the system is not geared towards responding to the poor people who are in need. He may be asking for a bribe, uh, you know, that person may be just negligent. But uh, when this kind of a system is in place, basically this Kisan Mitra helpline is acting as an accountability mechanism because that official knows that once it's come to the notice of the Kisan Mitra thing, if it doesn't uh, get solved within a couple of weeks, we are going to escalate it to the collector. And uh, then the collector is going to take action against the official. So it's basically doing this kind of a bridge where it also becomes an accountability mechanism. So he got the land record changed within a day. Uh, within a week, the drip irrigation thing was approved uh, and his crop was saved, number one. Then we also worked with the bank to do a one-time settlement so that he can just pay part of the loan and the rest of the loan is uh, settled with the bank. This kind of a settlement banks do routinely with companies which go bankrupt. Right? Uh, we know that there's a 90% shaving. I mean, it, it's, it's called a haircut uh, uh, in, in Indian uh, financial terminology. Um, but, so thousands of crores are waived for companies, but for a small farmer like this, we need to make the intervention. So this, this is just one example of the kind of intervention that we are making. So, so far in the last six years, we have handled about 16,000 plus uh, different cases. Uh, which means that more than 50,000 calls we would have handled because each case, uh, you know, has multiple calls in order to reach a resolution. Uh, and 70% of these issues are resolved. Another 30% are still pending. Some of them may have hit a roadblock where we cannot really solve them because most of these issues are basically trying to make some department or the other do their job uh, properly. Uh, so now this helpline is expanded. We started with one district. It's now working in six districts. And just wanted to also uh, add one more aspect of this, that uh, we not only deal with the individual cases, right? Solving individual cases like that person is one part of the thing. But uh, many of the, many times this also, uh, uh, you know, the, the Kisan Mitra calls also uh, lead us to systemic issues. For example, uh, we got multiple calls when there were heavy rains that the crops are getting flooded and damaged, but no government official was coming to uh, take stock of whose crops got damaged and what kind of help the government can extend, right? But there is a National Disaster Management Act existing in India, which requires that whenever there is such natural calamity happens, the government officials need to figure out who have lost the crops and provide some kind of disaster relief. So that was simply not happening in uh, in the Telangana state for the last several years. Uh, so uh, when this happened in 2020, uh, we then escalated and filed a case in the High Court and the Telangana High Court uh, gave a landmark judgment in the PIL uh, public interest litigation that we filed saying that uh, it is the duty and it's not a uh, it's not optional, right, for the government to implement the law which already exists on the books. Uh, so they came down really heavily on the government. And uh, one of the things which we exposed in this whole court case is that actually the uh, state government itself had assessed that 15 lakh acres of severe crop damage happened. They had written to the center saying that 550 crores should be sanctioned. Uh, the center sanctioned only one third of that, which is 188 crores. And uh, but even that money was just lying with the state government, it was not released to the farmers. And uh, if you look at it in dollar terms, that is about $25 million. Uh, so uh, that's just another example of the kind of impact that we can create when we try to uh, work uh, on the systemic uh, change. Uh, so just want to end by saying that uh, the kind of support that, uh, uh, you know, that comes from aid and aid support is here, uh, makes a lot of difference. Um, this is another initiative that uh, 
uh, we are involved in but just want to give you a certain sense of the numbers you know that are involved like for example this kisan mitra helpline right now it is working in six districts we want to expand it to 10 districts to add each district to this it takes about $10,000 uh, of funding to uh, ex for us to expand to uh, more districts or uh, to support a particular uh, field staff right uh, who works with women farmers and forms them into a collective uh, about $200 per month about $2,500 would pay the salary of a person so these are the kind of uh, 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 you know financial uh, requirements you know that we have to keep this kind of work going uh, really thank all of you for coming on a Saturday uh, evening uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I think 2015 was the first time when I came and made a presentation on agriculture issues. Srivats uh, was there and then uh, Archana was there, a few people. And uh, they really encouraged that, you know, we need to uh, scale up this work much more and then we need to take this to a lot more uh, places. And that's a journey that we have uh, undertaken in the last few years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiran. Uh, we'll uh, have some time for questions for both uh, our next speaker and Kiran in a minute. Um, uh, it just kind of occurred to me that a district is like a county here. So in 2018, when we were uh, talking in a similar gathering just before the pandemic, we had said that, uh, you know, it was in two counties or two districts of, let's say, Washington state, you know, that, so this was in two districts of Andhra Pradesh state and Andhra and Telangana states in India. Now it's in six, so it's like tripled. <laughs> uh, so when uh, Arvinda and I were, uh, you know, back in India, and my interest uh, in visiting the valleys, uh, valleys was alternate energy, and hers was uh, was in education. Uh, we saw that, you know, a very, you know, charismatic and very jovial uh, group uh, was also in these uh, in these villages, and they were working on health. And uh, what this group was trying to do in those days was it was uh, trying to teach Adivasi women who don't know how to even read and write through picture books, identify problems such as cholera and malaria and things like that, and try to uh, prescribe medication for things that they could be prescribed or do referrals to the district hospitals by pictures of how, a, uh, by drawing, uh, during sunrise, take this medicine, sunset, take this medicine, and so on. And, and we soon found that this group was opening saline, <laughs> you know, bottles to show village people what they were being charged for giving saline. It was taking attendance. It, was, it had created notice boards in front of primary health clinics in villages. And in these notice boards, the village people take attendance every day whether the doctor is in or not. And that group is uh, Sathi, that is run by Dr. Abhay Shukla, who graduated from AIMS in India. He's uh, part of the National Human Rights Commission, the National Rural Health Mission, and, uh, uh, and over the years, AID has collaborated with Sathi on its health, uh, you know, programs. And uh, I would like, uh, you know, Abhay to come and share both his jovial mood. Uh, you know, one fantastic thing for me when I, you know, see people like Abhay uh, and other, you know, activist friends in India is like how they can talk about serious issues, just smiling and laughing, uh, you know, and, and it's amazing. Like they're never put down and they are talking about the really the most serious issues. Like I don't have that personality, but Abhay does. Abhay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ravi, for introducing me, and thanks to all of you for being here today. And it's a great opportunity to interact with all of you. I have interacted with the, some of the AID Seattle volunteers during the COVID pandemic, um, uh, when you know there was a very difficult situation, and uh, at that time, AID support actually made a huge impact, uh, positive impact for our work in Maharashtra. Just to first complete the story, which Ravi partly mentioned about the saline bottles. In India, if you go to any rural area, more or less, uh, patients who go to a doctor, the doctor will say, Tumko saline lagana hai. You know, <laughs> you need a saline infusion and then they will charge a, maybe 500 rupees or something and give a saline infusion, which is actually not required. So what we used to do is in the villages, we would go with a saline bottle and open it 
and give it to people to drink. So you see what is there in this? It's actually just salty water. <laughs> it's not a medicine. <laughs> it's not some takad wali dawai. You know, it's it's just basically salty water. So that used to demystify the whole thing. Are ye to namak ka pani hai? Iske liye hum 500 rupees kyu de rahe? And then we would tell them you can just do the same thing. Take a glass of water, put two spoons of sugar, one pinch of salt, and drink it up if you have diarrhea. You know. So that is what we used to do. For the saline. Anyway, so yeah, so I have the challenge of um, covering uh, the ground of our work of the last 15 years in less than 10 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'll try to do that. But I'll just, uh, I mean, I'll just begin by saying that our relationship with AID, Sathi's support uh, from AID has been for the last uh, nearly 15 years over a whole range of periods. And like a good friendship, which goes through multiple phases, but still you remain friends. Uh, so I think Sathi and AID have remained friends over these last 15 years, and many different things which we have done. And each time we try to do something new, uh, you know, we would ask, "Ye kya kar rahe aap log? Iska, you know, what is the logic behind it?" But I think we were able to convince <laughs> the AID group, and finally they appreciated it, and you know, we really moved ahead together. So it's been a kind of a partnership. So I'll now bring you to something which is both serious and also which has led to huge changes and churnings, and that is the COVID pandemic, which you all know about. And probably you know that India had the largest number of COVID deaths in the world if they were counted properly. There was a huge amount of underreporting, but if you look at the WHO estimates of excess deaths, incidentally, during COVID, of course, many people died of COVID. Also, a very large number of excess deaths took place because non-COVID patients could not get required care, and those deaths were not counted. But those are also excess deaths during COVID. So, people who required dialysis, tuberculosis patients. Patients with HIV AIDS, with so many other, even women requiring deliveries. If they went to hospitals, sorry, this is now a COVID hospital, <laughs> so we don't <laughs> admit any other kind of patients here. So those deaths also need to be counted. So anyway, the excess COVID deaths in India were about 4.7 million, 47 lakhs, which is a huge number, much more than any other country. And within this. The largest number of cases and deaths were in Maharashtra. Um, you know, uh, about 1.5 lakh deaths, according to official figures. Nearly 30 percent of the COVID deaths in India were in Maharashtra. So that's why we really had to, you know, reach out and do something to, you know, ensure that people got access to care. So how did AID support us in this period. I'm not going into the details. I'm just telling you a few important things that we did. So one was basically running help desks in public hospitals, especially in rural areas. You can imagine that there is a taluka or a block which has only one public hospital, and that public hospital has been converted into a COVID hospital. That there are two lakh people living there who have all kinds of daily health problems. They go to the hospital. यहाँ अभी COVID hospital है इधर आपका इलाज नहीं हो पाएगा. So where do they, where do they go? Or even COVID patients who went there and they said, "Abhi bed nahi hai, yahan ka bed to you know full ho gaya." So those help desks guided people that okay, this is a COVID hospital, but this is where you can go. We'll arrange the ambulance for you. We'll arrange the transport for you. Or if you have a COVID problem, people work day and night to arrange COVID beds for patients who are not good getting beds locally. And probably we saved you know hundreds of lives. Through these 40 help desks across Maharashtra, you can see the map, and uh, you know our volunteers provided support and guidance to over 80,000 patients in the COVID period in just a little more than one year. And this entire activity was made possible because of AID support. So I'd like to thank you all of you for that. Um, another activity which we did in urban areas, and incidentally, urban areas were the worst affected during COVID, as you probably might be knowing. हम लोग ऐसा सोचते हैं कि गांव के लोगों को बहुत प्रॉब्लम से जो कि हैं ऑब्वियसली लेकिन शहरों में भी इन सिटीज आल्सो एस्पेशली रिगार्डिंग हेल्थ केयर देर ह्यूज रेंज ऑफ चैलेंजेस व्हिच बिकेम मोर एविडेंट ड्यूरिंग कोविड सो वी स्टार्टेड ट्रेनिंग विमेन एज पेशेंट एडवोकेट्स सो इन अर्बन एरियाज देर इज जोग्राफिकल एक्सेस यू मे बी लिविंग नेक्स्ट टू अ मल्टी स्पेशलिटी हॉस्पिटल बट यू प्रॉब्ली कैनॉट इवन सेट योर फुट देयर अनलेस यू नो विच गवर्नमेंट स्कीम 
or which entitlement or which you know kind of you know process uh, through which you can get so uh, these women uh, they actually uh, did all kinds of you know guidance uh, to patients and also distributed patient diaries patient diaries is something a new, another innovative activity which we did that in a urban area like pune all the information which is important for a patient was put together in a single booklet and that was you know given to people phone numbers of officials of hospitals of social workers of scheme you know uh, contact persons and etc cetera, etc cetera. charitable hospitals where you can get free care and this was quite useful and then we set up a helpline so like kiran talked about the kisan mitra helpline we had a, uh, you know health helpline which guided a lot of patients to get care during covid but i'll move ahead from there uh, also to talk about what happened in private hospitals um so maharashtra is a very privatized healthcare system like many other states in india the majority of people actually seek care in private hospitals during covid a uh, large numbers of patients actually went to private hospitals because the government hospitals didn't have enough beds and uh, the maharashtra government had laid down guidelines for rates which maximum rates which charged so so the maximum rates for for example an icu bed was 7500 rupees per day which is a large amount of money but still it was some kind of for a ventilator bed it was 9000 rupees per day so we took this as a benchmark and said even adding a little more for maybe some medicines and all 10000 rupees per day should be the kind of maximum that can be charged and then we reached out to thousands of especially covid widows so just like you talked about suicide <laughs> related women who lost their husbands tens of thousands of women lost their husbands to covid during you know during the covid pandemic and they landed up in a situation where their main i mean their family member was gone and now they were because of the hospital bill <laughs> 5 lakhs 10 lakhs 15 lakhs 20 lakhs they were landed up in a huge you know debt situation which is almost impossible to come out from so these issues we 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 did a survey uh, uh, of 2500 plus such covid videos and other families and we asked them how much they had paid for their hospital bills and we found that 75% of them had been overcharged and this was followed by various activities there were assemblies of some of these families and their family members where they came and told their stories i am not going to tell you those because we don't have time but you can imagine some of them were really um painful stories and then we had a meeting with the health minister of maharashtra and we said look these so many you know patients have been overcharged you need to do something <laughs> so you should audit those hospital bills and ensure that the excess amounts which were charged are returned now this is something unprecedented it had never happened <laughs> in the history of maharashtra at least probably no other state in india but they de they actually decided that and sathi along with some of our networks we then started this audit process they you know the pictures below are of these audits where patients came with all their bills they all their hospital bills and then the hospital owners were called and then the officials came and sat and said ye aapne itna charge kaise kiya maximum charge was 7500 per day how have you charged 25000 30000 per day so you have to return and as a result of this excess amounts were refunded to a significant number of especially these women uh, who were who had lost their husbands and uh, you know 63 complaints were successfully resolved more than 16 lakh rupees was refunded by the private hospitals to these patients which is a unprecedented uh, you know um, and many more <laughs> many more got unofficial refunds because basically what happened is हॉस्पिटल ने उनको बुलाया देखो तुम वो कंप्लेंट में के पीछे मत जाओ हम आपको दस हजार रुपये दे देते हैं यू यू नो एंड ऑब्वियसली पीपल फेल्ट दैट दे वर गेटिंग समथिंग बैक सो मोर देन हंड्रेड यू नो सच फैमिलीज गॉट सर्टन काइंड ऑफ रिफंड्स सो दिस गेटिंग द मनी वॉज पार्ट ऑफ इट बट दे ऑल्सो गॉट जस्टिस एट सम लेवल एंड अ मैसेज वेंट आउट दैट यू नो कंप्लीटली आर्बिट्री चार्जिंग इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी काइंड ऑफ टॉलरेटेड सो नाउ आई एल जस्ट मूव अड क्विकली to point out that what are we actually trying to do with aid support and i'll talk about three major models which we are now developing and i think as kiran also pointed out our task is to change systems it's not just to give handouts to people 
that's not something which is going to be sustainable it's not just to even temporarily help a few people of course we do do, do that and especially in covid kind of situations we had to do it but our primary objective is to build models which can be upscaled and if we build we demonstrate that this is a model which works then you know there is a better chance that it can be upscaled and reach out to many many more people than whom we can you know through our own organizations do so i'll talk about three models the first model is regarding primary health care in rural areas as you know tribal areas rural areas in across india and maharashtra people are not able to access health care uh, as they need uh, to do it uh, what is the space that we identified here jan arogya samitis or people's health committees which are actually supposed to be there for every sub center and every primary health center but we found that these were uh, not at, at all functional so we reformed reformed or reformed <laughs> these committees uh, in these pilot areas uh, in in pune and nandurbar districts and we then uh, took the yeah, the jan arogya samiti members to visit the health center आप जाके देखिए यहाँ क्या क्या मिलता है और क्या क्या मिलना चाहिए एंड अरेंज द डायलॉग देन वी डिड एन ऑडिट प्रोसेस व्हाट इज द अमाउंट ऑफ मनी दैट हैज बीन रिसीव्ड हाउ इट नीड्स टू बी स्पेंड एंड देन वी लेट टू दिस लेट टू अ पार्टिसिपेटरी प्लानिंग एंड दिस लेट टू मेनी मेनी चेंजेस एंड इम्प्रूवमेंट्स विच आई डोंट हैव द टाइम टू शेयर विद यू इवन हैव अ वीडियो अबाउट दिस बट बेसिकली minor issues which were not which could have easily been resolved but were not getting resolved got resolved so for example in jambli village uh, we have a video about that where there were two children school children who were part of the janarogya samiti and they said that our school doesn't have a toilet <laughs> functioning so how can we go to school and isn't this a health issue it is health issue so wo pichle 2 saal se chal raha tha ki toilet nahi hai and this was raised in the janarogya samiti it was immediately escalated to the zila parishad level within 8 days a new toilet block was constructed in that school you know so <laughs> so there's there are various such stories which which it happens if people get mobilized and they become aware uh, you know of their and now we are also forming what we call hugs or healthcare user groups uh, you must be knowing that uh, peop, you know patients with diabetes high blood pressure um, they need to take lifelong treatment which is pretty expensive if they have to go to the private sector now this is being given through health and wellness centers or at least it's supposed to be given but the patients have to be collectivized so for the first time we are collectivizing actually the patients in rural areas to come together they also support each other they give each other some advice you know ye roz leni hoti hai dawai aisa nahi ki kabhi thoda le liya fir beech mein band kar diya whether it is diabetes or high blood pressure and also some of the diet and other related issues so this is also something which is underway so overall jan arogya samiti is is a model which can be replicated across india there are more than 1.5 lakh health and wellness centers in you know across the country but jan arogya samiti is not operative in most places at least in maharashtra we would like to upscale this model the second model is about urban areas and after covid we decided as a policy to start working intensively also in urban areas until then we had a sort of a bit of complacence ki gaon mein kaam karna zaruri hai shehar mein to theek ho jayega sab you know but we realized that for several reasons which i will not go into detail but at least three reasons number one migrants who are in urban areas are often in a worse situation even than people in rural areas and it is actually people who are refugees from rural areas who are landing up on the margins of society in urban areas today and the agrarian crisis which kiran pointed out the impact of that agrarian crisis is felt in terms of these migrants in urban areas and they need urgently need access to healthcare they don't have social networks they don't have social capital in rural areas at least people have some sort of you know collectivities so so we need to work with them and the public hospitals in urban areas cater to large numbers of rural patients if they don't work then it's not only the urban people who suffer even the rural people suffer like the district hospital or the sub district hospital so anyway so here we have started working uh, in urban areas with the significant support from aid in uh, three cities actually we started with one then we increased to two पहले हमने पुणे से शुरू किया बिकॉज वी आर बेस्ड इन पुणे देन वी एडेड यू नो नाशिक एंड नाउ वी एडेड सोलापुर सो आई एम नॉट गोइंग इन टू द डिटेल्स बट बेसिकली वीमेन यू नो ट्रेनिंग ग्रुप्स ऑफ वीमेन एज महिला आरोग्य समिति विच इज अगेन अ फॉर्मल स्पेस विच इज नॉट 
usually activated and also uh, enabling them to visit the public health facilities to demand the health, health services and also mapping of the urban health services and forming urban health plans which can be taken up as a socio-political issue especially for example before the municipal corporation elections almost all corporations in maharashtra are supposed to have elections which have not taken place <laughs> for various reasons yeah okay the third model is about private hospitals and as you know 70 percent of people seek care in private hospitals given our experience during COVID, uh, we again identified a space for change because maharashtra government has uh, adopted certain new rules according to which a patient's rights charter, which has 17 uh, patient's rights, needs to be displayed in every private hospital. The rates, indicative rates, 15 indicative rates need to be displayed. So if you go to any private hospital, you should know how much bed ka charge is, how doctor ka consultancy charge is, uh, you know, operation theater ka charge is. And thirdly, there needs to be a grievance register cell in every city and every district, which will help patients regarding private hospitals. This is not only for poor people. I can tell you even middle class people need this in, in, in India. This was there on paper. <laughs> it, it was, you know, so then we started taking up this issue. And just to tell you briefly, we had Rugunahaka Parishads or, you know, patients' rights, uh, you know, kind of assemblies in three cities, Pune, Sangli and Nashik. In these three cities, now the patient's helpline has been started. It's a toll-free number which has been declared, but it needs to be done on a much larger scale uh, as I will, uh, you know, conclude. So this is my final slide. Basically, support from AID has been so important for us. Sathi works with multiple sources of support, including the government. But it is AID's support which enables us to be innovative, <laughs> which enables us to do things which nobody else has done before. Which, uh, you know, of course, you ask a lot of questions, which is very good. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, you know, if we say that we are going to try out something which is, uh, there's no guarantee of success, but at least there's a good chance that we'll be able to do something which is different and which will build a model. And these are six models which have been supported. Patient advocates uh, in urban areas, civil society help desks during COVID, uh, audit of private hospital bills, Activated Jana Rogya Samitis and Social Audit of Health and Wellness Centers, Patient Support Helplines and Healthcare User Groups, which I have already just mentioned to you. So these right now, we have initiated these models. These need to be upscaled. We need support for this so that we can upscale it across Maharashtra. Reach out these models. We need to now go around and tell people. We need to orient people in other parts of the state. They see, we have done this in Pune or in Nashik. You can do it. There are 26 corporation cities in Maharashtra. We have only reached three. So we need to reach out to the remaining uh, you know, areas. And these can lead to health system, health system changes and impactful models of community health action. Uh, for which, uh, you know, we appreciate the support of AID and hope it can be continued. Thank you. Some copies I have got, so they are kept outside. If you want to see reports of some of this work, uh, they will be there at the reception. Yeah, there are also many doctors uh, in the audience, Abhay. So, I, Abhay will be available during dinner time. Uh, so, Saif and Alia, Dr. Sudhakar and his group, uh, and uh, several others. Maybe all the doctors here should raise their hands <laughs> or people in the medical field <laughs> and then I can connect with you all. So that is you. Yeah. Sai, Arya. Okay. So yeah, so that's it. You have doctors in the front two tables. The rest are engineers <laughs> or programmers. <laughs> so uh, so we'll have our time. I'm going to time this exactly five minutes, uh, you know, for uh, Q&A with Abhay and Kiran. So please make your questions brief and responses brief. Abhay, Kiran, please come back or come in front. Uh, I also want to point out that, uh, you know, AIDS work in the first phase of the pandemic uh, was covered by New York Times in the second phase of the pandemic. And uh, that led to uh, CNN and other, uh, you know, organizations covering AIDS work in India. Particularly the kind of work we did in, uh, you know, Mumbai was covered by New York Times. And that led to a groundswell of support for it. We raised $9 million uh, in the two years of COVID. And, uh, uh, and 
that uh, I do not support uh, went to about a hundred or more groups in India, like Abayas and other groups working on, on tackling the emergency. So please raise your hand and you know, you're welcome to take the mic or just ask the question. We'll come to you. Yes. Um, hi, uh, this question is sort of for both of you. Um, I see that a lot of your work is uh, sort of systemic, as you mentioned. Um, luckily or fortunately, you had given examples where the administration at some level, some chain, they were um, you know, helpful. They, they were ready to intervene, the collector or the health minister, etc. Do you have any use cases where they were not helpful at all? I mean, I want to know your failures also. And um, what kind of protection do people get if they come up and they say, hey, I'm going to raise my voice and do they get protection? Like, you know, that's the first thing I'm thinking, a farmer, woman going and saying and standing and raising her voice and something could happen to her, right? So that's the first fear I have. How do you handle all these things? What are your failures? How did you manage that? Yeah, so, uh, see, definitely uh, the cases that we talked about are uh, things which success were achieved after, uh, you know, several months or sometimes a couple of years of work, right? Uh, and a lot of those challenges are still uh, ongoing. Like, for example, we are working on recognition for tenant farmers, which the Telangana government has taken an adamant stand that they will not. Uh, so, therefore, that fight is still going on. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, what we face when we raise these questions are concerned, uh, see, in general, in a properly functioning democracy, uh, I think raising of these questions or even going on streets to raise questions or going to the court and so on, uh, should be encouraged by the system. So. We, we have faced situations where the collector themselves, you know, told us that, see, I can't solve this problem at this, at my level, therefore, why don't you go to the court and file a case, right? So, those are the good officials and then we get a good uh, response from the system. Uh, but we also face situations where, let's say, the Telangana government has told us that, uh, you know, you are raising too many uh, troubling questions, so, uh, uh, you know, kind of threatened us. But it's a, uh, I mean, I, we know that they are not going to carry out the threat. Uh, but uh, you are right that, uh, uh, you know, it is a difficult, uh, you know, situation to face. But in general, when uh, people who are at the receiving end, right, like the farmers and so on, uh, when they come up and speak, uh, they don't uh, typically face repercussions at like a, at the state level, you know, because they have come uh, to Hyderabad and speak. But back in the village, you know, if there are people who belong to the ruling party, and they feel that you know these people are troublemakers, then they can face uh, you know certain uh, 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 certain challenges in the uh, village, right? Uh, but I think uh, you know basically people have to be ready to face those things and raise the voice. That's the only way forward. Which is the... I'll just quickly respond also to that. It's not a failure; it's an unresolved problem. <laughs> and there's a big difference between these two. Okay, you see, you put in some effort, it doesn't get solved. At least you have to put in some different kind of effort, you know, or maybe you have to try some different way. And usually it has to be escalated. So it's not getting solved at the level of the block, go to the district, not getting, getting solved at the level of the district, take it at a higher level. Uh, so that is one thing. And the second thing is not just raising it individually. Almost always it is raised collectively. And the advantage of raising it collectively is that's a group of people, uh, which is, you know, in the forefront, not just one individual. Despite that, yes, there are sometimes uh, backlashes and there the collective has to be ready to stand behind the individual. If that is there, then that we can deal with it. So it's, it's always a, the collective which is dealing with it, uh, which can you know prevent that kind of a backlash. And finally, it's all about power. See? <laughs> we have had the greatest uh, you know, challenges. This is a helpline. Pune mein kar diya, Nashik mein kar diya, Sangli mein kar diya, Mumbai mein nahi huwa. Mumbai is the capital of Maharashtra. It should have been the first city to have done this. And you know, I have sat in a meeting recently across the table with all the top private hospital owners of Mumbai city, you know. You might be knowing the names of some of those big hospitals. And they said, why should we do this? And you know, they were not, they were very reluctant to do it. And I don't know to, whether to call it a failure, but yeah, we made a wall. So now we'll have to try something different. It's the law of the state which they're refusing to sort of implement. So it's a question of power. So when you are met with resistance from power, you have to build stronger counter power. So we just have to work as well.
Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for all the amazing work that you've done. Um, are we doing anything to hold these leaders accountable or like these doctors that are overcharging these patients? Is there any work that's being done on that front? Well, you talk about two things. You talk about leaders and you talked about doctors. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, our um, challenge is not with doctors, it's with hospitals. And this is an important distinction. Today, healthcare in India is getting more and more corporatized. Corporate hospitals are growing, which are not owned by doctors. That is the old model where a single doctor used to, or doctor couple used to have their chota hospital. And you know, yeah, uh, nursing home. Nursing home huh? Now we have big corporate hospitals or big multi specialty hospitals where doctors, actually, the bill of the patient, only about 10% goes to the doctor probably or maybe at the most 15%, most of it is actually being charged by the hospital. So the problem in the bill to a significant extent is because of the hospital management having certain kind of profiteering practices. So as I said that uh, ensuring that every hospital has to display the patient's right charter, has to display the rates is a form of accountability. It's a very, I mean you can say a small form of accountability, but where we had zero accountability at least now we have some step forward. And you know, as uh, has been said that uh, you know, if you give me a place to stand, I think Aristotle said this. You give me a place to stand and give me a liver, and I can move the entire world. <laughs> so if you have a place to stand and say that look, this is your list of rates, how can you charge more than this? It changes the dialogue. Right now, patients are completely helpless usually in private hospitals. Bill de diya, bhar do, khatam. You know, so aapki isme rate list mein ye likha hai. You should charge according to this and patient's rights charter has various other things, right to information, right to second opinion, right to records and reports, right to informed consent, etc. So leveling the field between the patient and the hospital, we are at least moving forward in that. About leaders, I don't want to talk right now. <laughs> I think all of you perhaps know as much as we do. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I guess we are the only table with doctors uh, here. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, the group of doctors who are in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, auditorium are not just interested in incomes, but also outcomes. And, uh, and uh, so my question is actually to uh, uh, Kiran, uh, who is a good friend as well. So, you, you know, there was, during your presentation, you mentioned that there is this, um, government scheme where when a person commits, I mean, when a farmer commits suicide, you, that then the government steps in and kind of clears the debt and does the whole, um, helps the family and that too in a very difficult way. So how do you handle a situation where a farmer might feel like that might be the path of least resistance? So how does it, do you see that self-preservation kicks in and then they that is kind of an absolute last resort or do they in a weak moment take that as a uh, you know as a difficult step yeah you see we we also wondered sometimes about this but uh, we clearly what we've observed is that uh, you know the fact that uh, if you commit suicide there is some scheme through which your uh, you know family may get some money has never been an incentive actually to commit suicide because that is a uh, I mean basically committing suicide is not a rational step it is a step which comes out of a, a you know emotional turmoil and uh, difficulty so I don't think it's a calculated uh, thing and we've never come across that because now we also uh, have uh, dealt with many cases of attempted suicide like we've gone to hospital and looked at all the people who uh, consumed pesticide did not die and then we dealing with them. So we've never come across a case where people are making that kind of campaign. It's a basically a desperation uh, which is pushing them. Uh, but ultimately, uh, apart from uh, you know helping the families where the suicide has happened, the government should also be uh, looking at how to uh, address the situation before that kind of an extreme step happens. So that is why we are advocating many policies which actually help the distressed farmers uh, before they take that kind of step. Thank you everybody. Uh, okay, so we'll have the very last question. 
Thank you so much for everything, whatever you guys have shared. So, one of the problem which I see it in India is, one of the thing is, in the education system, you're not changing some stuff where the good officials get made rather than the bad ones which you took an example of. So, do you guys work with the education system or anything that solve the problem at the root level? When the government funding is coming, that should automatically disemburse so that you don't need to go to file a case. Because those folks who are right now getting educated in India, they will be the future leader, to your words, right? So, do you guys work with those kind of, a, you know, organization or system? But let's fix it at the root level, right? So that we don't need to do the vendor and all that. Thank you so much, Kiran. You want to give a quick response? Uh, no, are you saying that uh, intervention in the education system so that they become better officials or they become more accountable people and so on? No, I say ultimately that is really uh, required. Uh, but uh, I don't think there is an easy solution there uh, because uh, you know we are talking about a billion people you know getting educated. Uh, so in uh, India, I think basically uh, as far as the education system is concerned, uh, preparing uh, the children to become good citizens uh, has not been uh, has uh, that much of a focus within the education system, and that, I think that is a, a big problem. Preparing them with some skills or to become an employee is what actually the education system is geared towards and that definitely needs to be addressed. So we education doesn't take, take, take place only in schools. Oh, that is. The, all the work which we describe is education. I hope I, you were able to communicate this. Yeah. People getting educated about their rights is also a form of education. So if the problem is an imbalance of power, the solution is an, an empowering people through whatever you can call it education or awareness building so that they can challenge that power and claim their rights. So education is not just what happens. Of course, what happens in schools is very important and you know that needs to be improved, but that alone will not be sufficient. So I think a lot of the work which we do is actually also educating people in a different way. I think I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, I think the COVID part that Abhay said and we also talked about, we should also contrast it in the US. Like I think the doctors here can correct me, most of the COVID treatment was picked up by the government and uh, and people, you know, were treated free of cost as far as I know. Uh, while in India, of course, as Abhay said, they had to pay, uh, you know, dentures for every, you know, thing like. So, so, that, so that's one thing, you know, I wanted to point out. And the other thing is, though we dislike insurance companies, in a way, they have to audit the bill of the of the medical bills here, and that audit process is what is missing in the private hospitals in India. There is no, you know, nobody is auditing them. Uh, and with that, and considering COVID, I would like to give a round of applause to that all the doctors in the room who have served. <laughs> Thank you, Abhay and Kiran. Amit, over to you. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, first, I would like to really thank all three of our speakers. Uh, please stand up and let's all give them a big round of applause. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can we can read about all of this uh, on the internet. There's an in, in, almost an infinite amount of information available on the internet. You can really see videos. But I think uh, just hearing the stuff from people who really work on it on the ground is invaluable. And I think uh, I really, really appreciate them coming all the way here and sharing all these uh, stories and their work with us. Uh, I would like to uh, thank one more group of people, and I think I'm sort of included in that group, is people who have, uh, who have volunteered for AID, maybe they are, uh, okay, that's uh, it's, uh, people who have volunteered for AID ever, right? In the Seattle chapter, 10 years back, volunteering right now, or in a different chapter. So if you could all stand up, that would be great. Um, <laughs> thank you. And uh, you know, like any other organization, people uh, come and go, life changes happen, so some people are able to volunteer certain periods of time in their life. And then things change around, but uh, thank you, thank you all for this. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Shrivats to come over and uh, share his experience as a aid patron and a aid donor.
So, Schubert. Thank you very much. And Seth warned me that I better keep it short because I'm the one standing between you and dinner. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's an unenviable position. But uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I just wanted to say a few words. The, the, you know, I first got associated with aid about eight years ago, and I think Kiran, you were right. It was 2015, where it was a lunch session that Kiran was talking about the work that they were doing around millets and the farmer's crisis. This was when I first came to face with, um, you know, just how tragic the situation was and the appalling travesty of knowing that the very people who worked so hard to put food on our tables were the ones who were often going hungry. And even worse, in many cases, as we just heard, killing themselves, and sometimes because they were in debt of about $1,000. To put that in context, $1,000 is roughly what I think this evening we're spending on the food for each one of these tables. So just think about that, right? That, that's what people were giving up their lives for and leaving their families destitute behind. And the other thing that I remember from that event was the entire lunch was uh, made from millets. And that was the first time I was eating dosas and idlis from millets. I was like, wow, this is really interesting and unusual. <laughs> Anyway, when uh, Ravi asked me to speak uh, tonight, the, there were three words that came to me. The first was uh, honor, to be honest, and I should actually get up on stage because I wanted to say that it's an honor for me to share a stage with people like Ravi and Kiran and Abhay. Because honestly, uh, when I think about the work that they do, I mean, I'm in awe of their dedication and their spirit of service that they bring to their everyday work. And it's, it's just, I mean, it completely, it's mind-blowing. And to me, these are the true superheroes who walk amongst us, even though they're not very close. <laughs> the second word that came to me was um, privilege. When I look around everybody in this room, I think we're all very privileged. We're living in the richest country on the planet. We're in one of the most prosperous cities in that country. and. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say that none of us is worried about putting food on the table for our families or a roof over their heads, right? I mean, this is real privilege. And also, of course, the privilege to be able to actually think about doing good for somebody else. So keep that in mind. And the third word that came to me was opportunity. Because despite the daunting challenges that I think face India, especially rural India, and also urban India, course. I think the flip side of those challenges is the massive opportunity to make a difference. So what I'm going to ask people today to do is to really think about your privilege, embrace the opportunity, and let's try to do something that, you know, really makes a difference in people's lives. So not all of us, certainly not me, are designed to do the work on the ground that people like Abe and Kiran and, you know, all the rest of aid folks on the ground are doing, but I think what we can do is to support their work with some meaningful financial contribution, whatever works for everybody. It's an individual choice, obviously. So I'm going to ask everyone, please dig deep, open your hearts, open your wallets, because that's more important in this case, and find a way to give generously to support the amazing work that Aid India is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shubhas. Totally second the motion. Opening your hearts, opening your wallets. Absolutely. Um, just uh, one last uh, thing, uh, just in terms of logistics. Uh, each of you should have on the table an envelope with your name on it. If you do not, uh, I think Sonika is holding one up. It should look like a white envelope with your name on it. If you do not have some, uh, please come over and talk to me. I, I have some spare ones. Uh, that is uh, for you to uh, provide your donation um, in whichever form you choose. Uh, if you have company matches, please uh, make sure you enter them and uh, let's take advantage of that. Uh, we have a silent auction for a few items going on outside. And uh, that will close in about 10 minutes. Um, and, right, um, yeah, and I think uh, right now we are now open for dinner. Sorry, we ran a little over uh, the budget time that we had. But I hope you all enjoyed the, enjoyed the conversations, enjoyed uh, listening to the amazing work that the people here are doing. And now let's go for dinner. Thank you.